Okay, I think we are live in our first Down the Rabbit Hole live cast. We're delighted to have a rebirth of, um, of five chums that spoke together, oh, going back about six months ago on Libra and the central bank digital currencies. And we had some fairly heated discussions at that time. But obviously, with what's happening with the coronavirus, um, it's causing all sorts of challenges and uh, and uh, yeah, health-wise, finance-wise, everywhere-wise. And we thought it would be great to get five of us back together um, to talk very civilly um, and to discuss some controversial subjects in a very uh, open way um, so that you know, we can really get some, some cool ideas out there. So really just want to give you an idea of the way we see this, this sort of... Uh, uh, this happening we're we're very much we reckon it's going to be about 45 minutes um if we find that it becomes really interesting and there's a lot of stuff going on we'll, we we may extend that but uh so very much we, we're just going to get into really trying to look at where the blockchain technology can help with the perhaps more the after effects of the coronavirus because there are lots of problems that are being seen so i guess my first question um, uh, is really to, just for everybody to introduce themselves, to give us a quick 30-second introduction as to who you are and what you're working on, just to give um, the audience a bit of, uh, a, bit of a, a background um, on what you're doing. So do you want to go ahead first, uh, Ed? Sure, sure. So my name is Edward Plowright. I'm the creative director at Crypto Global News. Um, a bunch of you guys who are watching this have probably already seen um, like my YouTube videos and all that stuff. And we do at least three news updates a week. And at the moment, um, we've uh, had to shut down our office because of the coronavirus. Um, so the bulk of the content we're getting out is on our website. Um, but yeah, I'm quite a seasoned Forex trader, um, done a lot of work trading um, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and a number of other altcoins. And uh, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. And I'm a, a very, very experienced uh, film cameraman and editor. So that's how I got into this. Okay, excellent stuff. Um, and then we'll go to Milen Marinoff, um, who I'll let him introduce himself, who's our, uh, our European and Chinese expert, as he'll explain. Yeah, uh, hi, my name is Milan Marinov. Um, I just moved to Sydney like six months ago, been uh, eight years in Beijing before, and involved mostly in the finance consultancy and blockchain projects in China. Currently, I'm still consulting uh, one of the major uh, Chinese uh, investment projects. And since I came to Australia, I became part of the blockchain Sydney community and very happy to join these guys. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Milen. And, and Milen last time gave us a lot of insights for what's going on, what was going on in China with, uh, uh, with uh, the CBD, you know, the central bank digital currency. So we'll come to Milen to give us his perspective on what's happening in China. I'll turn to Dom now to give an indication of, uh, of who he is. Thanks. Uh, Dominic Jokovic here, CTO of Fractonium. I'm currently developing the blockchain development kit. Uh, an SDK and front end apps uh, to develop fungible and non fungible tokens and smart contracts without code. Uh, BDK will allow enterprise and developers to deploy chain agnostic blockchain solutions and third generation chains such as um, Algorand, Hedera, Hashgraph. We're also uh, looking at Australian national blockchain uh, using IBM blockchain uh, when it's available. Uh, so we'll be able to do chain swaps with uh, using configuration rather than uh, having to rewrite code. So that's currently what I'm working on at the moment. We've got a few products coming out of that platform, um, but that's very much what I'm concentrating on. Excellent. Thanks, Dom. And then I'll bring in Brad to give us uh, 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 yeah, a bit of a, an insight from his side. Brad is also um, working behind the scenes. So if you've got any questions and that type of thing, just um, you know, put them up and uh, I mean, Brad will give you a bit of an indication of how that works, but I'll let Brad just uh, introduce himself. Sure, thank you, Tim. Yeah, Bradley Hughes. I'm also with the Fractonium team as a co-founder with Tim and Dom, currently working on uh, product definitions, working through our roadmap of what we're building in conjunction with Dom and Tim to uh, get to market with our uh, tokenization and fractionalization platform. Um, the 
chair of FIBRI, the Sydney chapter, which is the foundation for blockchain uh, in real estate internationally. And we've got a number of co-chairs around Australia. Uh, so I'll be uh, putting on some uh, blockchain and real estate events in the near future. And I'm the co-organizer of Blockchain Sydney Meetup Group. So uh, I know some of the, the people that are uh, joining us this evening have uh, come through our Blockchain Sydney Group. So welcome to our members. Good to see you here uh, virtually, uh, not in person at this point. Um, so yeah, looking forward to sharing with you over the course of this webinar. I do have my eye on the chat window and uh, anyone, if you've got any questions, you're welcome to raise your hand and pop a question in the chat and I'll facilitate that uh, towards the end or fit it in if it's uh, you know, something that's particularly um, uh, insightful in the moment of, of the flow of the conversation. So back to Tim, thank you. Excellent, thanks Brad. Um, so as you can see, we've got a wealth of experience um, on board. I mean, just to give you a bit of a background for those that may not uh, um, know me, uh, I'm the CEO of Fractonium. Uh, we're developing a funding platform it's going to turn corporate banking on its head. And we've been working with uh, a major bank in, uh, in Asia that uh, is, uh, we're um, you know, creating some, some initial ideas for them, which is, uh, is, is very interesting. Um, but uh, I've, I'm also, uh, you know, also written a book called Down the Rabbit Hole and uh, have uh, launched the Down the Rabbit Hole podcast. And this is part of, uh, part of our continued uh, contribution to high quality content. And we will be doing a broadcast every Thursday at 7 p.m. Australian time. It'll be Sydney time every Thursday for the next 12 weeks because we recognize the coronavirus is going to cause a lot of changes. And um, there's lots of content that, and lots of ideas that um, we think we need to bring out because the, you know, what we're seeing in, in the whole space is that there's a lot of changes that are coming about the way in which we think about things, the way we do things that are coming around via this coronavirus. And I think it's one of those classic, they call it an exogenous shock to the system where we've got, you know, issues that are affecting, you know, they're affecting corporates, they're affecting the airlines, affecting health, whole variety of things. So let's get straight into it um, because I'm really conscious that you, you don't want to listen to me. You want to hear some, some great people here. So I think it's really the key thing that we, we want to try and sort of explore is where the blockchain is going to fit into this. So I'd just like each of the panelists just to give us a quick 30 seconds of how long do you think this coronavirus virus is going to you know, take to work its way through the system in terms of, you know, for us to come back to a sense of normality? And what would that normality look like? So, do you want to start off, Brad? Sure. Um, look, I don't think we're going to return to normality as in business as usual the way it was before this uh, pandemic has uh, started sweeping the world. It is a catalyst for some pretty dramatic transformations, um, as we have seen in the markets, particularly. Um, you know, oil hitting a, an 18 year low. 30% coming off the, uh, the Dow Jones, etc. So I think that the post World War II era of the Bretton Woods Agreement Accord period, um, I think this is putting an end to that. Uh, I don't know what will happen with the trend towards globalization, whether we'll see uh, a more of a multipolar world emerging out of this as, the, um, as things settle between the US and China. But uh, I, I suspect we'll see a shift away from the US as the sole uh, reserve currency petrodollar of the world out of this as everything falls out and um yeah we'll see where it all lands um yeah digital currencies uh, central bank currencies i think is going to be part of our conversation tonight excellent and and what about you dom what's uh, what's your view of how long this is going to last and what is normality going to look like uh well maybe this is the new normal i think uh uh, I think that we'll see more remote working. I think that will become a standard. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we take the, the Prime Minister's advice and we've got to fight this for the next six months, we start to develop new practices in business, don't we? And it's, it's unlikely that we'll go back to the old practices. Uh, so where practical, people will, will do more work from home. Um, we'll see 
I think CBDCs definitely uh, will see an increase in that activity. Um, and, um, and we may see, you know, the decline of, of the use of cash. So um, perhaps social distancing is the, is, <laughs> is the new norm. Yeah. You know, interesting, interesting. I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly causing a shift in the way we all look at things. I mean, we're all here today you know, in different locations, just trying to sort of bring everything together. Um, and there are some technical challenges. We hope they don't materialize during the session, but there are some technical challenges that come through, especially given that globally, a lot of people are actually uh, working from home and that's putting a strain on the whole sort of in internet infrastructure. So, you know, it's gonna be, there's bucket loads of change that's gonna happen. And Milen, what, what are you seeing, especially given your experience in China? I'll be interested to, to hear what you think are going, yeah, you know, how long you think it's going to last and, and what, what are you seeing from your buddies in China um, as actually having already changed that might represent the new normal? Yeah, well, <clears throat> first of all, nobody knows how long this is going to take. That's for sure. This is literally projection, probabilities. But um, what I can see is that uh, each government uh, reacts in a different way. And I wouldn't like to really prize the Chinese government, but actually they've done an extremely good job. And some of the methods uh, they, they've been using is probably sound harsh for us, but actually this was the only way to, to control the situation. They were like uh, asking people to leave home, controlling, basically my parents-in-law came back uh, to China like a few days ago, back from Australia. And they've been met in, in the airport by the special person from their province and drive them to a special hotel and they'll be isolated for two weeks, fully, fully, fully sponsored by the government. And every person who arrives in China now being isolated and uh, actually guided by a special, special person in there. Uh, overall, uh, today was the first day where there'll be zero cases registered in Wuhan. Today, zero, which is a major step ahead. And those drastic measures uh, seems uh, provided the results. Uh, as you know, uh, Italy and other countries requested the Chinese help. As Chinese used to know how to deal with this, as far as they have the experience with SARS as well. So in general terms, uh, I think that the China will lead the world more or less in order how to, how to solve it. And I just spoke with a friend from Shenzhen and Beijing like half an hour ago. They reckon Beijing is like 80, 90% back on track. The, the, the streets are full of cars, Shenzhen as well, within a week or two. Excellent, okay, it sounds as if there's a lot of really positive stuff happening, which is great. And Ed, what about you? What's your take on this? Where do you, you know, see the, the new normal and, and how quickly? I mean, I guess, given you're from originally from the States, what are you, what's your, what's your views? Well, um, I mean, what I've been looking at a lot over the past week, especially with, you know, the, the rounds and rounds of quantitative easing, because um, the Fed hit a, a big round of quantitative easing. I'll just say QE for, for short. Um, I think it was about three months ago, and it was it was a small amount compared to what's happened in the last two weeks. It was about 480 billion, and you know now in the last two weeks it's been two trillion. It's it's just becoming a joke. So um, I don't. I, I agree with Bradley. I think we may see the end of um, maybe not the end of the dollar, but certainly the end of it is the world's reserve currency, as the, the petrodollar, if you like. Um, we're certainly going to see. Um, uh, currencies from uh, central banks, digital ones. It's going to happen. It's going to happen faster than we thought. I thought it was about, you know, five, 10 years away for some Western countries. It's probably going to happen in the next 18 months. And I think the other thing is we're going to have a UBI, a universal, universal basic income. And that's going to become the new normal um, across much of the Western world. I think those things will happen right away. Insofar as um, a broader view of the economy and supply chains and that, the only way we're going to be able to answer that question is retrospectively, because every week it goes on more like this, we get further away from what we have now. Um, so, you know, if this lasts six months, then we're never going to go back to the way it is. But if it lasts two, um, human beings have very short memories and we may go back to this, you know, global model in four or five years and people just won't care. You know, I lived through September 11th and I promise you, 
it, it wasn't the first year, but a few years later, it was kind of normal to get in the streets. You know, it was different. It's always different at airports now, but, you know, going to the store or any of those things, um, it just became normal again. So I think mm, uh, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get into something that might be a little bit contentious. Okay. Um, now, the, the, the ground rules are very much, there's no shouting, no swearing. Let's just keep it civil, please. <laughs> because I think the thing that, that really hit me about this whole, uh, the whole events in the past week, more than anything else, is that financial markets have collapsed. Let's be realistic. And there's a lot of financial strain on the banking sector. The oil coming in has really caused that problems as well. But the, you know, it was last week when the stock market fell by 10% overnight, but Bitcoin fell by 50%, right? Now, historically, um, you know, when Donald Trump was first elected, Bitcoin went up by 5%. When Brexit was announced, it went up by 15%. So it was touted, and, and I was a proponent of it, I have to say, back in 2016, about Bitcoin being digital gold. So my question is, gold is normally a safe haven in times of difficulty. So I'm going to put it out there. I think Bitcoin is not digital gold anymore, and I'll explain my thoughts behind that later, but I want to hear everybody's opinion. What's your view on Bitcoin being digital gold? And if it's not digital gold, what role will it play? Let's start with you, Dom. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> um, look, I, I think Bitcoin's role is purely speculation. Uh, it's not a store of value. It hasn't been in a very, very long time. It's not digital gold. To satisfy the criteria of a store of value, it has to maintain its value over a period of time and it must be predictably useful um, when it's exchanged at some time in the future. Um, so if it has to retain its purchasing power, well, we're not seeing that from Bitcoin now, especially, especially right now. <laughs> so uh, definitely not a store of gold and so, oh, sorry, a store of value. And so nothing like gold, like physical gold. Okay. Well, let's, let's, Let's get, uh, we'll come to you in a second, Ed, because I know you're very passionate about this. <laughs> Milen, we'll, we'll get you as, a, as a, a reasoned person who's got some wide experience. Not that you're not reasonable, Edward. That's, please don't take that wrong. Um, from given your Chinese experience and just your wider experience, Milen, uh, do you think Bitcoin is digital gold? Well, I mean, the whole concept of uh, being digital gold is not working. Uh... But the Bitcoin has a different quality and quality is actually the transactions. Uh, you don't need actually to hold the value of transacting because it's literally the same as fiat. How much this paper, paper note costs? Literally zero. But uh, the transaction uh, quality is actually what makes the, the Bitcoin as a pioneer of the blockchain valuable. And coming out from China, as we know, China is much more advanced in order of digitalizing the society. And digital remedy being postponed from last November until indefinitely, but I believe it will come soon. And what China is going to do is they're going to connect their central, uh, central currency with, 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 let's call it the centralized networks, the corporate currencies. So literally we'll have the ecosystems within ecosystems in order to help the corporations to make payments between themselves in and out of the country. So Bitcoin itself is not a uh, store of value, but because of its, its scarcity, it's uh, obviously valued by somebody. And in the end of the day, like every market, as long as there is somebody willing to pay something for, for this, this asset, it's there. And in the long okay. run- Okay, all right. You, you brought out some very interesting points, which will, be talking on a bit later about central bank digital currencies because I think that you yeah that's going to be a massive in area of discussion. Run, just, let me, just give me a sec. Uh, in the long run, I think Bitcoin is not going to lose more of its value. Probably it will increase based on the scarcity. Uh, plus, the new millennials, new generations, have a different perception and concept about the value itself. 
Okay, well, let's bring in Brad. Come on, Brad. I know you've, you've got some healthy opinions on this. Okay, well, yeah, Bitcoin is certainly not digital gold because unlike gold, Bitcoin has memory. Bitcoin has a ledger. Bitcoin has a history since its genesis block of all the flows of value from all the mined Bitcoin and all the Bitcoin that has been transmitted between individuals. It's a digital signaling system. It, it contains a wealth of information that uh, shows flows of value transfer. And also it is used as a, um, an attestation system or a, uh, a checkpointing system because of the sheer computational power embodied in it that it can't be easily subverted. Other chains, other projects, information sources, like you can even um, trade in rare digital artworks that are embedded into the Bitcoin blockchain. The counterparty protocol, for example, is a layer two protocol where all the assets exist in Bitcoin. So yes, it's a financial instrument on the surface level. It's used as a, as a speculative instrument, but it's much, much more beyond that. And it is unlike anything else prior to the advent of Bitcoin. So digital gold, in my view, is, is spot gold. You know, the world's spot gold market is digital gold because it is a lot larger than the actual physical gold holdings. So if you want to talk about digital gold, perhaps look at the, um, the, the gold trade that occurs in the financial markets as the digital representation of an underlying physical asset. And that's going to get very interesting as the physical price is already starting to decouple from the spot price. There's just not enough metal in the world to fulfill. Okay. All the so, so, so you think, you think Bitcoin does have a role. So we'll, we'll, we'll oh, come yeah, back to yeah, that. Sure. We'll, we'll come back to that uh, in a second. So Ed, over to you. I know you're perhaps more crypto friendly than, than, than myself out of being, being honest, but, but uh, you know, I'm open-minded enough and, very willing to hear opposing opinions. So go for it. What's the role of Bitcoin? Is it digital gold? No. That's wow, it. we're agreeing on something. What's going on? <laughs> hey, 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 we had to have it eventually. Even a broken you know, a clock is right twice a day. But um, no, it's, it's not. And look, I'm, I'm not going to say anything more because everything I wanted to say, um, Dom said verbatim. So um, I'd rather just move on to the next topic because he just took all the words out of my mouth about how I feel about it. Um, yeah, that's it. So. Sorry, Ed. No, no. God bless you. You know I love well, you, man. Well, look, it's, um, it's perfect. Yeah. Let's let's maybe sort of shift this a gear into central bank digital currencies then, because that's something that I think is uh, is dramatically going to change. I mean, just as as one element that that I think it was quite interesting, physical cash. All right. China, as soon as the coronavirus was detailed, they actually disinfected cash. All right. They, now, there's a, a study in 2003 that showed that the SARS virus can stay on uh, paper for up to 72 hours. All right. Now, they haven't done the thing on the, you know, the latest version of COVID-19. But Brad, myself and Don were in Myanmar um, going back in January. And it was, you know, we were informed by the bank there that the average thousand chat note, which is the equivalent of about an Aussie dollar, has 72 days of urinal bacteria on it, okay? So in terms of spreading the virus, you know, or spreading illness, any form of paper currency is gonna be really challenged. So why don't you take up on that mantle uh, as, as the first part of central bank digital currencies, the removal of cash, what do you think, Ed? Um, well, you guys all know me, you know, we've all had, you know, uh, beers and stuff before. Um, I'm a freedom guy and I understand that there are health risks and we have to talk about that and we have to talk about how that affects um, us and our families and our communities and everything. But if you take cash away, you take away, I don't want to call it security, but certainly privacy in, in a major way, you know, and it's difficult to make the argument because there's pretty much no jobs left that pay even in cash, but you can still operate in cash. You can withdraw your your um, your income, and then you can go and buy goods and services as you see fit. But if it becomes a central bank, uh, you know, bank digital currency, that's gone, and everything you do will be tracked, everything. And that makes me very very uneasy. You know, we're already headed that way with everything I said before about the UBI and all that stuff. But like, this is the next level, and once we have this, then the freedom is gone. Your freedom to to operate in a free market it's just it's 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 um gone the way of the dodo okay so all right i'll 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 take on board that point and then throw it back to Milen if I may I mean if you've got nothing to fear nothing to hide, 
What's the problem in privacy being lost? It's all right, Ed, I'll give you a chance to speak in a second. What's wrong? Yeah, any, any issues with that, Malin? John, you've well, lived in China. I mean, give us your, your opinion. Well, I mean, like, if you, if you look at the Chinese society for the past, like, five to six years, I mean, digital, digital cash is already there. Uh, via WeChat and Alipay, Chinese are very familiar and uh, we, with this type of payments, I mean, I haven't been having cash for like six months in China at all, like zero. And they don't find this as a disturbing uh, sign. But the point is that not all the transactions went through to these payment channels. Uh, from the other side, we need to know that the dream of every government is to, to go cashless, cashless society. And obviously the big problem there is the money laundering, corruption, and all the stuff which they're trying to resolve through this new digital system and new digital land. And I believe in some point they will succeed uh, because kind of uh, the society is different and they follow, they follow the government. It's very important and it's very different than, than our democracy society. So uh, uh, talking about the ads uh, issue, well, there's a called decentralized finance solutions are on the way. There's a lot of different tries in this area. So probably we'll have the centralized uh, circles and chains and we're going to have decentralized as well. And we'll see how in the future those will interact. So this is the way I see the future. They'll be centralized and decentralized. Okay. All right. Excellent. Brad, what are your thoughts? Well, I suppose to just address the um, the nothing to hide, nothing to fear argument for a moment. I think Edward Snowden said it best, arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different to saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. So it's one of those things that there are multitudes of cases where, where privacy is important. Um, I won't go further down that track, um, but to speak about central bank digital currencies, I think we will see a trend of um, central tracking for larger transactions, but I believe that legislatures, for the most part in most nations, will attempt to strike a middle ground where there will be tracking on perhaps larger balances being tracked, like, for example, here in Australia, we have Austrade, we already have, already have existing legislation, transactions $10,000 and over get tracked, we're going to be eliminating cash payments above 10000 but I think that there's no need to track all the day-to-day -day micro payments that occur on digital platforms and you know, letting people go about their day-to-day their -day business with small transfers. I don't think we need to see all of that data consumed by government and analysed. I don't particularly want the government to see you know, where I've stopped at a bar to have a beer or you know, these kinds of things, you know, profiling built up on people over time. False conclusions can be drawn from data. So I, I believe that we'll see a middle ground where you know, significant value flows, of course, do need to be tracked and reported, and we'll see that happen, but hopefully we'll also see some common sense prevail and uh, yeah, there'll be thresholds. Okay, I mean, it's interesting. There was, uh, I've been doing a bit of research on central bank digital currencies and looking at, at the way in which um, you know, privacy links into central bank di digital currencies. And I guess it makes it, it does, there is going to be a real balance between privacy and the effectiveness of the, of the tech. I mean, because with central bank digital currencies, you can program the money. So what sort of things do you think that could bring up? Dom, what do you think? I mean, from a technical point of view, if you, yeah, you know, how does that, uh, um, how does that, that work? Do you think in terms of what, what could the bank do or what could the central banks do? In terms of privacy, Sorry, you're, you're muted. With the programmability structures, um, you know, well, what, what, are, what are your thoughts from a, a technical point of view? How far could governments go with that technology, do you think? Well, I think it's really interesting. I think you could program the economy, couldn't you? If, if you, if you can predict behaviour of your citizens and you have the ability to print virtual cash, uh, on demand, you could you can pretty much program the economy uh, with a with a bit of AI. We can we can start to see where we need to push that economy. It may even come into budget planning. So I think that 
being able to track that currency electronically. Uh, it's not something we can currently do, um, you know, without <laughs> recording every serial number and tracking it through the system. Um, I think that we can program, program the economy. Um, I'll just go back to a point where you were talking about how do you think it's going to change our view of cash. Um, I heard today that uh, Golf Australia announced this week that they're only going to do tap only uh, transactions, no cash. And I heard on the radio that uh, coffee shops were going to follow on with that as well. So we, I think it's going to creep up on us. I think we're going to lose that ability to use cash. Um, and we're probably not going to mind because it's convenient. And it'll be like the whole Facebook privacy thing where you give your privacy away without even knowing it's occurring. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we'll end up with, uh, with a lot of people using coronavirus as an excuse um, to have a no cash policy. Okay, well, well um, and Ed, okay, go on. I'll, I'll give you a chance to, to, <laughs> to, to come back because I know I can see it's in your eyes, it's in your blood, it's in your, you know, go on. Come back at me. Come back at me in a nice way. No, no, no. I, you know, I've got a lot of respect for you, Tim. No, look, it's just um, uh, Bradley said it best. Uh, it, this idea of, you know, um, why do we care about this um, if, if we're not doing anything wrong? It's, it's a very short-sighted way of seeing the world, you know. And I know that um, I think America is the only country left in the world or the only one maybe ever that actually had true freedom of speech. And it was, it was the first thing they put in there with the Bill of Rights. And it was there for a reason. And you have to have that level of freedom. You know, you have to empower the individual um, because one day uh, maybe the individual can't speak or has no power. And then what do you do? So look, I, I do see some benefit in, in the ideas of the central bank digital currency. Um, but overall, I prefer if it was a completely decentralized model, you know, and if there were 50 or 100 different cryptocurrencies we're using to transact with, I prefer that world over, you know, the central banks running a show. Okay. Now, Brad, I think you've got some experience. Is it the, or some knowledge of the, the Indu card that restricts the people, the spending of money uh, for people on welfare? Do you want to just, because this could be a bit of a forerunner to central bank digital currencies in terms of privacy. I mean, you've got some comments on that, yeah? Uh, yeah, so I am not uh, deeply familiar with how it operates, but I have followed a lot of conversation online, particularly on Twitter, around the Australian Indu card, which has been piloted in some uh, remote communities, um, notably in some Aboriginal majority communities, where people on welfare are restricted to using the Indu card. They're not no longer receiving the ability to withdraw cash. The idea is supposedly to stop them spending cash on uh, undesirable things that have negative impacts on their communities. But the consequence is that local stores that accept it uh, can set high prices, it's anti-competitive, people no longer have the ability to do cash transactions on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. So they lose a level of bargaining and a level of ability to um, manage their own finances and they're trapped into limited expensive options. So it's already having some pretty detrimental impacts where it's been trialled. And they're, they're like ACOS, the Australian Council of uh, Social Services and a few other um, you know, non-government groups have expressed a great deal of concern about it. So, so there's a bit of a debate going on about that right now. Mm. Okay, interesting. So, I mean, you know, I get a sort of sense from everybody that um, digital, you know, digital currencies and probably central bank digital currencies are very much going to take over um, cash and, and very much coronavirus is driving probably the increased adoption uh, on that, um, on that overall, and I guess it's the privacy issue that we've really got to sort of take into account, isn't it? That's going to be really important. But if we look at what's happening within the financial markets, for example, with all the stock market falling and quantitative easing coming in, is there not an argument to say, well, you know, the ability to control the economy in sort of whatever environment it might be by being able to program money and being able to draw money back or stop money going to certain sectors. Is that not a good thing overall, given we've got, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a potentially horrendous Armageddon that might be facing us? Is that not worth giving up some privacy for? What do you think, no. Melen? Because you've, no. you've lived in China and, and where privacy, I think, is generally recognised as being fairly limited. What are your thoughts? 
Well, um, let, let's say I'm in the middle between the Chinese model and the Western model. Uh, well, apparently we need some guidance from, from the central authorities in certain, certain activities. Because what, what, what's happened in America now and what's happening in China are going on completely different ways. And we need to know that there is no way back uh, from what America is facing now. And even containing the, the coronavirus in Italy, this like basically chaos there caused this, this high rate of um, uh, already infected and, and dead people because the Italians just didn't take it seriously. Uh, while the, the Chinese have to deal with a much different uh, um, different environment, but they actually their success is much higher. So in the end of the day, uh, privacy is important, but uh, it has to be limited in certain certain cases. And once we're talking about the um, like programming economy, China model proved to be better for the past 10, 15 years than the Western one. And if we, we this is the facts. And the Chinese pol political leadership and the economy, econ economy rule is like much, much better in the strategic way than, than most of the Western powers. We have to admit that. And I think it has to be more centralized and more strategically orientated in, in a certain cases, but not, uh, not on expense of complete, uh, actually on the, on the privacy itself. Now, Ed, I can see you're quietly seething there. Go on, give us your, give us your thoughts. Go on, I, I, I'm giving you free reign without no bad words. I'm not going to use any dirty language. My mom is going to watch this, and I don't want her to be embarrassed over something. Okay, that's good. Um, no, look, I, if, if we look back through human history, and l let's just look at the 20th century, man, or, or maybe since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, so maybe going back to sort of the 1870s, 1880s, the more we brought in individual property rights and allowed markets to just do their own thing, the more they expanded and the more they exploded. You know, um, it, all these things, like if you look at the beginning of the 20th century, um, the telephone, the airplane, you know, all these big inventions, you know, those were built by, by private firms, you know, and those, those are private inventors going and doing it. You know, um, look at Microsoft and Apple. These were not government sanctioned or government planned programs. When you get into central planning, yeah, it works for a while, but it doesn't work forever. You have to let the market be the market and then it figures it out by itself because what happens is there'll be gaps and then they'll be filled by people who are innovative. So, you know, I'm, I'm all for working, collaborating with people else. We're never going to get anything done. But this idea of, of, of a planned economy, like, it, yeah, it, it, it has worked for a time in a number of places, but then it goes by the wayside. I think central bank digital currencies will have a tendency to actually make it far more centralized uh, overall. But I mean, I mean, if, if we just look at some of the problems that have been created by the coronavirus, I mean, I know in the States, Ed, they've um, postponed a number of primary elections and mayoral elections and that type of thing. I mean, just from the, the panel's point of view, what do you think about sort of blockchain voting, you know, that has been trialed in places like, I think in Washington state, they even tried some? Uh, it has it's, been it's tried. Actually been, yeah, tried in uh, Washington, Wyoming, and it was tried, or there's a bill, I think, on the floor of the Tennessee Senate, if memory serves me right. So, yeah, it's been, they're, they're going to bring it into the U.S. eventually, and I'm all about it. So, yeah. So, I mean, is the coronavirus with the idea of people not being able to go and vote, is this going to drive this technology to look at digital voting, where you can vote in your gym jams? You know, from the comfort of your, you know, with your, 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 your beer at hand. Brad, go on. You're, you're an ex-counselor for Ramwick. Give us your thought. Uh, look, the technology um, is available, being tested, but the transition or adoption, you know, how do you do it in a way that's equitable, that brings along the older generation particularly? Um, that's a big question. You know, there's a, a lot of... Um, communication, education required to, uh, to move people from, uh, you know, turning up and voting in person to purely digital voting. So it'll be a, a, an extended transition phase. You need to offer both in parallel for a, a, a good period of time, probably, you know, two or three election cycles would be my guess. It, it, it might happen in two, but it might take as long as three. Um, 
I think there's a lot of um, benefit to being able to have a record of all votes being immutably locked into a blockchain. Um, we're seeing differences of 20 to 30 percent between exit polling and eventual vote counts in some of the democratic primaries that have been getting conducted. Now that's an unprecedented margin of error between exit polling and under UN guidelines, that is a strong indicator of election fraud. Who knows what's going on? Why are these counts so divergent from exit polls? We don't know. But, but it uh, certainly would be something that um, the Democratic Party would need to have a good hard look at because this is the, um, the second primary cycle in a row where they've had this problem. Um, yeah, and, and there's still, last time I checked, there were still a million votes to count in California uh, and a couple of other states still hadn't been resolved after two weeks. So if we get voting that happens on chain with tallies that are updated in near real time, that can only be a benefit for tra transparency and uh, elimination of electoral fraud. So where do you, so Dom, from a technical point of view, where do you see the tech for this? Do you think it's ready to go? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are solutions for this already. It's a matter of the government adopting uh, one that, that already exists and has been proven uh, rather than trying to build their own and, and failing. I mean, we saw what happened with the, you know, e-health records and, and uh, the system crashing when everybody tried to, to uh, opt out of their system. Um, I think that governments should govern and uh, they should use third parties to develop technology and should adopt that technology, obviously after review. Um, but look, the technology exists already. Uh, I think we're seeing right now in Queensland, we're seeing a, a record number of postural vote um, applications because people are scared to turn up at the polling booths. I know that on the last uh, day that we were able to actually register for a, a postal vote for the end of the month, I got messages on my phone informing me about how to go about and do that online. So I wasn't exposed to a corona at the polling booth uh, on the 31st of March or 28th of March, whenever it is. Um, so I think that uh, I think there's a way to go. Obviously, Brad's addressed uh, there is a problem with trying to bring older people across that perhaps aren't uh, familiar with smartphones or the technology. Um, but I think all of that can be addressed. I think it's just an education campaign. They could, they could even set up, they could do a, you know, a, a, an interim step where people go to a polling booth and are taught how to, how to, how to vote on their phone, you know? So, um, but do you think it's possible? Do you think it's possible to to have a, a sort of an interim solution where millennials that will be totally used to using their phone do it by that way that automatically updates the records at the polling station, which takes them off the list, whatever, and that you know dinosaurs like me can still go and you know scrawl my little cross? Absolutely, and Estonia has been doing it for years. Mm. <laughs> so you look at the Nordic the Nordic countries; they're all doing it. Uh, all of their public services are on blockchain. They're available online. Uh, their voting is certainly done on chain. Um, and they, they all have keys, uh, private keys to do that. Uh, so, and, and for now, and now it's, it's a normal thing. In fact, their, their president uh, got on YouTube and taught people how to do it <laughs> by physically demonstrating it. Uh, so, I think that uh, we could have an interim step where we have that ability for people to be able to, you know, to be taught how to how to do that. Um, but I, I think um, I think it needs to be done. I think it's it's it, to wait three elections or four elections or five elections for this to happen. It's just this is crazy, absolutely crazy. I mean, one of the one of the things about digital voting is that people can see who you voted for although there are various technologies out there that will enable sort of private voting to be seen. Do you think, I mean, Milen, you're, you, you've spent obviously a lot of time in China um, and that's a very different democratic process as we know. And I guess it would be, and I don't want to use the parallel maybe of the Soviet Union, but do you think that blockchain voting would be enabled? And I mean, I, I mean, I guess, I don't know. I, I mean, I'll just I'll put it I'll put an open question. What do you think, Belen, about digital voting in China? Well, um, we should know that a number of big countries, including the US and China, this will never happen. 
because it's not a point of technology itself. It's a point of willingness of certain parties within the governments and politicians to use this technology. Because implementing the technology is quite easy to do. And we need to ask ourselves the question why they didn't do it. Because they're not interested of transparency. That was a very basic answer. And talking about talking about China, that will never happen, really. Because in the end of the day, Chinese have a different perception. Well, what is democracy in the end of the day, they're asking. As long as our middle, middle class and people are wealthy and the well-being is in the high level, does it really matter who is really ruling you? Because restrictions in China are not that dramatic or drastic, uh, you see, you think they are. Actually, people, people live very nice and normal life. I would say the privileges they have, certain, certain level of people around the middle class and middle businesses, and the lifestyle, it's a, it's a lifestyle you never have anywhere around the world. You have like first class service everywhere you, you go, everything you do, based on the current environment and social system. So, so, so come on, Ed, come on, Ed, give us the US perspective. We're not talking about like democracy or communism or social, it doesn't matter as long as the people live well, really. Right. Okay, come on, Ed, give us your, your perspective on the US. I mean, I know that you're, you're dying to give it to me. <laughs> no, no, I'm actually quite placid on this topic because um, of how I feel about voting generally. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it should be done on a blockchain. Um, I, I certainly agree with what um, uh, Bradley touched on before. You know, the last two um, election cycles, the Democrats have really botched it quite poorly with their, um, their primary process. And, you know, we can talk about fake news. I know we're going to get to that to do with the virus and all that later. But it just no one trusts the process then, let alone the people that are supposed to be running it. So, you know, it is an immutable way to do it. And we can go and check the records later. So I think it's a good natural next step. Um, the other thing is, is that there are because, you know, I love the technology more than I love things like Bitcoin or whatever. If we start implementing blockchain for things like voting, which in America happens every two years, um, and then four and six respectively, depending on who and what you're voting for, we'll find a multitude of other uses for it. You know, why can't we use it to manage everything else, you know, from how we collect our garbage, or there's a whole bunch of other applications we could use it for. And this is a very easy way to say to people, hey, if we can vote for our leaders with this, we can use it for a bunch of other stuff. So I'm, I'm all for it. Um, I think it'll take a while. And the other thing is to remember in America, if you just take the 2016 election, and I think it'll be different this time. Um, but I don't know, it depends on, on how bad the, um, the uh, uh, how poorly people feel about the two candidates that, that get there in November. But more people who were eligible to vote didn't vote than people who did. So, you know, even if we do implement the blockchain solution, how much are they going to actually use it, you know? Do you think the coronavirus will actually perhaps put this more into the, the closer frame? Because, I mean, if the government are going to be spending, the U.S. government are going to be spending $1.3 trillion on, uh, you know, on propping up the, the economy, they're going to look towards trying to cut costs any way they can. Do you think that might increase the narrative? I think Brad's trying to... Yeah, um, I think one of, the, one of the issues that we're seeing uh, arising from... Um, COVID-19 from coronavirus at the moment, um, the social distancing awareness, um, the need to flatten the curve. You know, you can look up the hashtag flatten the curve and also social distancing. There were calls from lots of uh, public health policy uh, people and from health professionals, people, you know, virologists, epidemiologists saying, cancel the voting, delay the voting, implement at least mail-in voting at the very least not blockchain straight away necessarily, but at least allow people to vote remotely through mail-in. But uh, several of these um, state uh, you know, Democrat uh, primaries proceeded anyway, even in the last couple of days. Uh, you know, Illinois and uh, I'm sure Ed can tell us the other one, there were two on you know, the last couple of days that uh, they could have postponed and said, let's bring in paper voting and you know, not put all those people at risk, which I think is a significant issue. Um, any large gatherings of people at the moment, there's, there's inevitably going to be transmission. It's such a contagious virus from, from all accounts that, um, you know, if it is transmission, transmissible in an aerosol, which a lot of people have been describing, you know, that the droplets, if you cough, that's in the air, droplets are falling, anyone can breathe it in. 
really we shouldn't have lots of people concentrated together. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think this is the key thing about the the whole virus that it's it is bringing out it's exposing cracks in the system, isn't it? I think uh, of a lot of different things. And I mean, you know, you touched Ed on fake news. Um, you know, about there's been a lot of there's been a lack of transparency, clarity, and a whole variety of things. Do you think do you think this is gonna the, the coronavirus is gonna change the way we view fake news and can the blockchain can the blockchain you know help in that way? Anybody wanna you know, give me their opinion who's who's feels strongly on that? I don't, I don't think it will at all because um, fake news is defined differently depending on who's answering the question. You know, so if you're a, a MAGA person, you're all about Donald Trump, then to you, fake news is CNN, The New York Times, and MSNBC. And depending on what they've got on the TV that night, you're not wrong. But then to the person who supports, say, Bernie or Biden, it's going to be Fox News. And depending on what they're reporting, you're not wrong either. So. Um, it is difficult. The only time I really get annoyed with the fake news is when we have something like, you know, COVID-19, where we actually have to be informed. Okay, how do we transmit it? If, if we do get it, what do we do? How do we stay away from it? You know, how am I going to feed myself if the business I'm working for shuts down? That's when it can't be fake. But I'm open to anyone's suggestion of how do we get around that, because I don't see a clear solution at the moment. And the other thing to keep in mind is, even though, you know, Millen's 100% correct, we're in the recession already. You know, the depression, this is the question, I mean, what happens next? But we're already in the recession. There's going to be more and more fake news because people want to prop up their businesses. So, you know, and, and that's just them trying to feed their families and make sure their kids can still go to college one day. So I don't know how to get around this, but I'm open to anyone's suggestion and ideas on how to get around the fake news, particularly if we have a, a pandemic or something. Go on, Brad, go on, go for it. Yeah, okay, so uh, from a solution design perspective, and I'll uh, pa perhaps uh, invite Dom to speak on the um, technical aspects of this, but from a solution design perspective, you can implement a reputation staking system along the lines that Twitter has blue check marks for accredited journalists, politicians, other public figures. You can introduce a uh, ID verification system where people's press credentials are uh, associated to their identity that gets written to, to on-chain. Anytime stories are published, you can have uh, validation or voting. People potentially could have a reputation score uh, based on their public profile and uh, other people like uh, members of communities, for example, could stake to those people and say, yes, I trust this person. And then they can stake that staked reputation against yes, this is correct or, or factual, and here's why, or no, it's not, and here's why. So you can build a, an on-chain uh, reputation staking system to, to reduce the uh, proclivity of fake news. Yeah. If I could just ask um, Brad a direct question about that. But so let, let's say that was the way forward. Um, if you did that based on the current system, and just go with the, the example I used before, we say Fox, MSNBC, and CNN, then Fox News would just be the most trusted news source in the country because they have the highest viewing. So they'd have the most people voting in their favor. You know, like um, Don Lemon, whatever is that guy's name, he, I think he has like a two or 300,000 views a night, whereas if you have Hannity, it's 10 times that. Um, where if you have Joe Rogan, uh, depending on the episode, it's 10 times what Hannity has. So then does Joe Rogan become sort of the god king of news and, and, and non-fake news? I mean, how does this work in the long run? You know, is there... What I'd love is, what I've been trying to listen to are doctors and these kind of guys. How do we get those experts to be the ones that have the highest ranking insofar as how well, we, yeah, we, we, give, we give the recognized subject matter experts on particular uh, topics, we give them the stake to vote on. We don't just give it to the, the masses of, of viewers or consumers. We set up the, the staking or the voting in a way that you know, it, people have got to have subject matter expertise or, or recognised domain expertise in order to, to stake on a particular um, you know, piece of information. I mean, it, it's, I, I do find it quite ironic. It, it just came out in the news a couple of days ago that the, in Argentina, the governmental blockchain or the, the infrastructure was actually hacked and they put, they actually infiltrated the newsletter that the government put out that actually put out fake news about the, the coronavirus. So, I mean, it's a, these are all going to be increasingly important issues that are really going to come 
you know, going to come, you know, what, you know, really well and truly into the into the into the fray of things. And I think once we get the the vaccine developed, um, that's going to be very positive. But I'm sure we're going to have a bucket load of fake vaccines out there. How are we going to deal with that, Dom? Yeah, well, I guess uh, blockchain helps with provenance, right? So if we can, if we can track the provenance of a drug that's developed by a company all the way through the supply chain, and we have uh, visibility, or, or we have uh, so a permissioned, even a permissioned DLT, where the appropriate authorities have uh, visibility onto that chain, then we can uh, we can. Uh, at the very end where it's being administered, we can uh, check to see that that, that drug um, has been through all the proper channels, hasn't been counterfeited or the labeling has been changed in some way, or um, if it's a temperature sensitive vaccine or something like that, yeah, that hasn't, uh, you know, through the use of IOT and devices like that, that it's been stored at the correct temperature, it's been transferred in the correct manner, that sort of thing. So we have these sorts of, um, um, solutions already. There are companies out there doing that. There's a startup called StatWeek in India that's uh, combining sensor uh, sensors and IBM Fabric um, to um, automate production and supply chain tracking. It's another co company called um, Vac. Uh, just off the top of my head, Vac um, Vacchain, I think. Vacchain.com is also trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think actually VacChain uh, was a collaboration between uh, US Drug and Supply Authority, something like that. Uh, and it's an FDA pilot anyway. Uh, I think KPMG is involved in that. Uh, they're using IBM Fabric for that as well. Um, and so I think using a permission blockchain that allows uh, companies to get in there and, and see what they need to see, those ones that have the permission to do so, obviously, and to make those changes. Um, yeah, the, the solutions are there. People are starting to build those solutions now. Right, excellent. Okay, so, so fingers crossed when the vaccine's ready, which might be, you know, 12, 18 months, we just don't know, but I mean, the chances are there's going to be bucket loads of fake ones out there, I guess. Now, I'm really conscious of time. Um, so final 30 seconds, all right? And I'm going to ask you one question after that, which will be a one-word answer. So the final question before the one-word answer question. 30-second final observation. If we head into recession, say in Australia and globally, where will the blockchain and cryptocurrencies fit in? In 30 seconds. Let's start with you, Brad. Uh, look, I think we will see some financial speculation in Bitcoin. Um, we'll, we'll see the Bitcoin price uh, possibly um, go up from the current lows again as um, more of the, the markets get unwound. Uh, but I don't think we'll see a sudden return to uh, the, the 20K, the previous high. We might see 10 to 15K again you know, over the next, say, three to six months, maybe. Um, in terms of what role it can play. Um, I think verification of information is an important one. So oracles, you know, data sources, and as Don mentioned, IoT devices feeding information into blockchain and into supply chains. I think that will be the big trend that will accelerate. There's already a lot of work being done on enterprise supply chain and uh, temperature tracking, all that kind of thing. I think we'll see applications okay. of that technology. Excellent, Dom, 30 seconds. Uh, I can only echo what um, Brad said with regards to the blockchain. With regards to Bitcoin, we are about 50 days away, I think, from the halving. Uh, that's where the mining reward is halved. And I think they, they go down to about six and a quarter or six and a half Bitcoins uh, per block. Uh, traditionally, we've seen um, uh, a bull run after that over the, uh, the, the following year. Uh, so I think we'll see Bitcoin return to its normal, you know, 15K, 12, 15K over the next six months. And over the, the following uh, 12 to 14 months, we might see it go a lot higher. Um, Obviously, this is, this, is, uh, this is not financial advice. Uh, just need to <laughs> clarify that uh, <laughs> from anybody's point of view. In actual fact, my question was going to be afterwards, what price will, will Bitcoin be in six months? But we'll 
come back to each of you to ask that question. But, uh, but uh, Milen, you know, your 30 seconds on uh, if we head into recession, where will the blockchain and cryptocurrencies fit in? Well, again, we're in a recession. It's just not officially announced, but will be very soon. Uh, blockchain is fitting in as already uh, data management, finance, and supply chain. I see this as the three main uh, streams of blockchain penetrating first. And as I mentioned before, the China is already doing a tremendous job of, on the data management within the companies there and uh, getting into consortium chains and then linking to the main, main chain, to the customers. So those three major uh, uh, directions uh, regarding Bitcoin, honestly, I have no idea, but based on the scarcity and uh, speculative uh, 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 behavior of millennials, it, it could get, get reach uh, 15, 15, 16. Yeah. Okay. And Ed, over to you for, your, for the, the final 30 seconds. Um, I, I won't put an actual price on it, but yeah, we're, we're going to see a, a rise mainly because there's, there's almost no retail traders in the space. It's just speculators. And um, even though there was sort of a consensus on the panel that it's not digital gold, a lot of people will see it differently, especially as the QE ramps up, because this isn't over. They'll do another couple of trillion in the next few months. And um, as that happens and the dollar weakens, people will look at other places to put their assets. So yeah, I think Bitcoin will um, go back up. And I think some of the altcoins will have some pretty, pretty big heydays as well. And, um, you know, it could even be there's more stable coins that are brought out that people look at. Um, but, yeah, we will see a rise in, um, in people putting uh, their resources into cryptocurrency. Right. OK. All right. Well, I think you've, you've all answered the question about where you see the price will be. Look, I'm really conscious we've, we've had an hour. Uh, we've had an hour altogether. So I think we'll probably need to draw a line under it there. But there's been some really interesting views, uh, guys, and I appreciate your, your taking the time to sort of share it with everybody. And I think, I mean, this coronavirus is really just going to change the way we do things. And it's only when there's dramatic change that new ideas really start to rise. And with the blockchain, we're all trying to find those early adopters for the tech. And I think this virus will cause people to change and will bring some new new technology out there. And I mean, you know, hopefully that will happen over the over the fullness of time. But look, thank you very much indeed for your time. And thank you for all the attendees that uh, that have joined in. Um, you know, we've we've had a few questions that have come through that have been dealt with in the in the dialogue. Uh, hopefully, those have been answered well, we will be running these every Thursday uh, at seven o'clock for the next 12 weeks, certainly to coincide with you know, what is likely to get more of a lockdown situation with the coronavirus. Um, so if you've got any uh, ideas that you, or, uh, you know, things you want people to discuss, we'll try and find and bring in a different range of experts every week. But, uh, you know, we're just very grateful to, um, to Brad, to Dom, Milen, and to Edward for your contributions tonight. And thanks everybody for, uh, for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Thanks.